space station walking simulator games. You wouldn't be remiss if you sat down some days and started to look at some story-driven games and imagine that the future is going to be nothing more than space stations going batshit insane and everyone inside them dying at a basic rate of 300 people per minute. Tacoma, the station, adrift, event zero, and now observation, and I could probably go on for hours, it seems. And most of them show the same dark future, if you believe them. These games' subject matter are what's ahead as we live vicariously through the NASCAR race setup of human-shaped potential meteorites all living in space stations just waiting for the easiest excuse to burn up in orbit one after the other. In Observation's case, a little bit of credit goes a long ways as they are trying to do something a bit different and turn that a bit on its head. Let's see if it did, shall we? If you're here, I'm Carrick, and this is ACG, where I do reviews that aren't two minutes long or filled with sponsored bullcrap. Enjoy the ride. Observation is by no code. It's a first-person sci-fi thriller. It's out May 21st for the PS4, and on the PC, it's on the Epic Store, and it's 25 bucks. As always, if you like the video, eh, maybe subscribe. So here's my review for Observation. 2001, a space copy, Lenevo laptops missing a huge branding opportunity, and finding out that HAL is actually spelled S-A-M. Graphics are up first. One thing I do have to mention is that almost everything in Observation is a spoiler from the story after a specific part, but not in this video. So while the video may match up with some elements I'm talking about, others it may not. Apologies for that, but it's impossible to cover this perfectly and review it and still not show you some of the more memorable moments. Now, while the competition in this genre, I would say indeed in the entire setting, is pretty flush when you really think about it, Observation does do well for itself with a series of cinematic choices in its effect used between the various static cameras of the main system itself to the random bits and bobs and disconnects of the sphere that you as the main AI can take over to the more movie inspired moments and the cutscenes that parse out the different parts of the story. And many moments of the game have an almost photorealistic look to it really does as much as it can with what it has and there's a nice offering overall of a cinematic feel, almost like a movie feel throughout it, and very high detailed textures and models for the most part, but not everywhere. Each of these games really that we've looked at in these genres offers their own ideas of a space station and its innards as a reflective of the moment in time that they were created. Tacoma with its almost Star Trek next generation lighting and burnished reflective feel to Event Zero with a Bioshock inspired soft corner and organic shadowed location kind of style. From start to finish, however, Observation certainly falls more into a drift style, and that makes perfect sense as they're both based in a more grounded, realistic depiction of space station life. Lighting is incredibly well done outside and most of the time within, and there's a sense of scale that is presented in such a way to really solidify the realization that the place you were just in and jumping around is actually much bigger than it feels. And all this is pretty good until someone takes their helmet off. Everyone except for one character has this gate mouth look like they're in a constant state of surprise, or they're highly detailed versions of those puppets in World Police. They just never really come close to the fidelity of the main game's locations. Luckily, this is helped by the scarcity of times it occurs, as usually everyone has their spacesuits on anyway because they're consistently worried about the threat of being jetted. Also, one thing to remember, there's not a lot of locations in this game. There's different sections of the craft itself, and that certainly does spread out as you continue to play it, but it's not necessarily going to suddenly randomly have you on some kind of planet somewhere. Now, when it comes to performance, a 1080 Ti with a current or last-gen i5 or i7 can easily get you above 60 FPS at 1080p resolution with everything set to high, and from there, picking and choosing various effects as well as anti-aliasing like MSAA, FXAA, and TXAA as you want. One thing to prepare for, though, is that the game is incredibly lean on all those options, from the game options to the sound options to the graphics options, so don't expect a ton of settings to be able to fiddle with. Unfortunately, with this title, I did not get to play the PS4 version at all. As a package, I would say, though, that observation on the PC, it looks good. It's got an eye towards a very cool cinematic flair, and while that doesn't really work so well when some of the in-game characters are up close near the camera, the animation of movement when they're at a distance really does work very well, and the space station's innards are quite detailed, and it looks very cool. It may not be as flashy as some of the other competitors in this space, but it holds up well enough for its price. Sound, music, and voice. There are signs of injury to the station crew. Oh my god. Is that... Oh god. Power, but a lot of the hatches are fully locked down, so... I'm gonna try something different here. And 
and this time I think we're going to do voice first. So you're slowly introduced to characters as the game progresses. And the first is, of course, Emma. Now, this is the only supposedly living person on the space station at the time. Throughout the game, she does a great job with some excellent writing as Emma discovers whatever happened goes far beyond the typical loss of contact scenario she was trained for by the international conglomerate that put her into space in the first place. And while there are some misses here, Emma does an excellent job filtering out data to you through exposition as well as her interactions with Hal. I mean, Sam. But really, I mean how, because, yeah, that's pretty much what we have here. And it is a little weird. There are some noticeable similarities between them. And while I agree that Sam sounds wonderfully artificial, I do think we pass the time, not only in the game, but in our own time frame, as AI and voice synthesis is just much better now, even than Sam displays here. But also the future time that this game occurs in doesn't really jive with this. This is aided, of course, by the gameplay that has you saving Emma's life many times, and Emma actually assisting Sam with a multitude of problems he encounters or limitations he has due to the narrative. That partnership and that team-up actually works really well. Later on, there are other voice actors, and they alternate between very good and just acceptable, but luckily, the majority is Emma. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is music. This is very interesting to me. There are almost three distinct layers here at all times, a very light ambient and heavy on the long discordant keys kind of moments. This is a ground floor for the rest of the game's music to experiment with. Sometimes, depending on puzzles or unique moments in the game, this layer creeps up and offers a very horror-centric style to the audio presentation. Then there's these more gamified moments when you're under a time limit or the tense elements in the game need to be presented with a faster tempo. And you get this ever increasing heartbeat ticking clock track that plays out. And that actually really does build tension well. Third is the main title sequence, which I would say harkens almost to a zombie movie style opening with crazy zoom ins on strange somethings splitting and joining and moving together in this alien symmetry that is highly creepy. That sequence is excellent with crunchy synths and artificial guitar whales playing off one another that came incredibly close to the sound of someone screaming. It really sets the mood of the game, and I mention it here last now that I think about it, because that was one of the major parts of the score that really stuck with me. And that brings us to sound. This is also well done with creaks and groans of a space station run hard and put away wet, consistently ripping through the interior or monstrous and tense groans and shudders and various samples that play around you most of the time. And during those particular times, it makes you feel like you're truly in the equivalent of a spam can someone taped 30 million horsepower thrusters to and then once it got into orbit promptly forgot about. For instance, when you're out repairing your station, that muted hum of every action you take and every thruster pulse or the inevitable time you're going to get turned upside down and you're going to hit the station, it's all filtered through this magnificent replication of the chassis of the robot becoming the speaker as it's the only thing there to transfer sound waves in the first place. And the loss of discrete right and left sound channels and that cupped off effect does make you feel solitary, which is exactly what they were going for. Overall, I would say I liked it. The presentation can feel lean at times, but I think for the subject matter, it works fine. And that brings us to gameplay and a bit about the story. You play as Sam OS, or Sam for short, the ship's AI. Now, after some strange event has caused the disappearance of the crew, aside from Emma Fisher, the only remaining scientist and astronaut aboard the space station observation, as Sam, you have a number of systems at your disposal to play with. Static cameras, hacking computers, opening doors, performing repair sequences, and basically keeping Emma alive as she tries to regain contact with home base and overall figure out what happened. Also, kudos to the general writing of Emma, because let's face it, if most of us were slapdashed into a giant half-destroyed space station consistently losing power, the first thing we'd do is freak the fuck out, and the second thing we'd do is probably eat everyone else's rations and cry ourselves into the sweet, sweet release of death. Not Emma. She's trained to work the problem, and she reflects a very easy-to-identify closeness to Mark Watney in the novel and the movie The Martian, and this helps keep the game grounded in the systems that it doles out to the player without really making you buy into the notion that somehow the only person left inside the space station feels less emotional than the robotic AI running the damn thing. And when it comes to the gameplay as a whole, it would come very close to calling this a walking simulator, but what helps it is the number of puzzles and interactions and how you move around the game world, even if the latter is fairly shallow, as well as the changing perspectives and situations you deal with on it. This is far less Tacoma and more Event Zero in its structure in a way. You're consistently turning systems back on, using the cameras to zoom into rooms and figure out secrets, or listening to messages and parsing different puzzles out. 
then jumping into spheres. Now, these are little robots that can physically interact with the game world, where Sam can hack using cameras and adjust software. The spheres are his physical representations in the game world, and observation is, if anything, an exploration of the teamwork and problem solving as you work with Emma throughout it in those two different ways. And this brings us to one of the better elements of the game, though not as used as I had originally hoped, and that's Sam's response system to Emma. When Emma asks questions and you find possible answers, you can see if you can use that as a response back to her. So you might dive into the crew roster to check vital signs, hover over a person, and then respond back to Emma with what the vital sign of a character is, or identify something broken in a spot by looking at it and calling her attention to it. And sometimes when you call her attention to it, she actually fixes it and not you. And there's something refreshing about that. The only thing that's not refreshing is that it's not used as much as I would have liked, as I said before. Sometimes it feels like Emma's constantly calling out for more data, more data, more data, and more help. And Sam lost his translator at the door and he's just like, um, green? No blue, no red. Okay, forget it. I'm just not going to answer her at all. This really did hamper the story a bit for me because it does pull apart that partnership I talked about before. Now, when it comes to what you're doing, problems can involve puzzles like getting the plasma inside an experimental engine to its correct levels by adjusting magnets in real time or figuring out strange patterns or putting together puzzles to hack doors that are physically damaged and need to be opened by Sam via the network systems inside. One thing that impressed me with observation is that when you start, it all appears rather mundane. You go around, you help Emma as she goes from location to location and then maybe jump into other less used elements of the space station and see if you can find extra story or hints as to what's caused the problem in the first place. But as you continue, suddenly the options actually get more vast with you tracking down other characters, using menus to find out radio broadcasts and more. When it starts, there's like two options in the menu system and then by the time you're done, there's five or six or seven. Soon you end up having those, and they don't drastically alter the game at all, but they do add a little flexibility where at first it appears there's not going to be any. There's a couple environmental as well as mechanics issues here that pop up. First, there are more laptops on the space station than a Chinese national hacking firm. There are laptops on the wall, the floors, and the freaking ceiling. And since technically you're weightless, I guess a ceiling could be the floor. So when you think about it, there are laptops on the floor, the floor, and the other two floors. It's crazy. You can come into a room and there's a laptop on a floor and then one on a stand next to a closed laptop next to another one. And then there are three more on the sidewall discarded like somewhere in this space station. There's this gigantic, consistently pregnant queen robot alien spurting these things out in some creepy upgraded womb that improves them with each birth. I mean, look at this. It makes the craft look weird. And while the inside of the International Space Station had never be considered to be lacking in computers and random locations, this takes it to extremes and makes you feel like it's just there to confuse you to have you look around more for something to hack. Additionally, the control for the spheres never feels right ever. First, the mouse sensitivity is through the roof and adjusting it never really locked it down. It was always either too sensitive or not enough to really feel comfortable. And a controller, yes, even on the PC, ended up working better here, though there were one or two puzzles where you had to hold two face buttons down at alternating times, which can require a bit of spider thumb to perform. And lastly, when it comes to how all this wraps up, it does have a couple of soft endings, which after a while started to bother me. You're like, okay, what the hell is happening? Then you're like, all right, I get it. And I sort of understand where the game's going and how it's ending. And then it ends again and then again. For a lot of people, I think where the excellence here in this game is going to come through is just that story. It is more like an indie film. It's a little bit like Moon or something like that. But there are some problems here. And of course, problems bring us to Fun Factor. I think we've all had that kind of conversation when a game starts out on the slow side and then builds up over time and you have a great discourse about what makes a good game and do all games need to start out strong and stay that way. Observation for many does and will feel like it starts out strong, and I felt that way as well, but it did lose some speed while it added flexibility in the gameplay systems at the same time, and to me that interchange is a balance that is worth actually exploring. It just didn't really end up nailing it in this game. It ends up having you sitting there sometimes for a little longer than you should, or many times during a puzzle or some other interactive moment, you end up having to watch a cutscene and you'd really like to just sort of move that story forward where the cutscene doesn't really feel like it wants to. So we're at that time, the rating. As you guys know, I rate games on a buy, wait for sale, rent or never touch it again rating system. I would say this is easily a wait for a sale. And that's even with its lower starting price. There was just enough here that really didn't pull me in. There is some stuff to enjoy here, certainly, and the story, despite the consistent feeling, it really does crib so much from 2001 A Space Odyssey and 2010, it might as well have been called 2019 A Space Sequel, it was still actually something I wanted to see through 
all the way to the end. And I like the indie sci-fi horror story that it ended up feeling like it was engaging me with. However, I was never able to shake that feeling of repetition that set in, nor the fact that there wasn't as much interaction as I would have liked. So anyway, that's it for me. I hope you guys liked the video. If you did, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, give it a thumbs down. Maybe check out Reddit or Twitter or Facebook. I'm all those. I also do Twitch streams of newer games as well as the International Podcast and some other podcasts. I would love for you to check me out there. All of the links are in the description. And of course, you can become a patron on the Patreon website which helps me continue to give you guys reviews that aren't two minutes long or filled with sponsored bullcrap. Peace out and enjoy the rest of your week.